honor to have a guest again from Sweden. And uh, Lotta, Charlotte Jenström is coming from Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions. And she's uh, working there in communications on mental health projects and she's former journalist. Yes. Oh. Hello, everybody. So I am the recovering journalist. I didn't do anything yet, but I'm happy to be here and I'm glad that we are invited because I'm here now representing the whole of Salar. That's why I'm wearing my best clothes today and my shiny shoes also. Ah, okay, so thank you. I'm going to tell you about this project, Health in Sweden. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but in 2015 we had a big influx of refugee and asylum seekers in Sweden, as did you. Uh, and we realized that we had to address this somehow, and that is the project. I would like you to look uh, a little closer to the map of Sweden that you can see behind. Uh, the little sharper blue lines there are marking, oh, look at that, um, regions, so that's the region, and the thinner white lines are local authorities. We have a lot of them, and so do you. I know you do. Uh, but that is one of the main problems uh, while we were working with this, that there are so many local authorities and regions. So there are 290 municipalities. Yeah. Does anyone else but me uh, don't like to pronounce a difficult word in English? Local authorities. Municipalities. Municipalities. I have to land on that one. Okay, local authorities. And 20 regions uh, in Sweden right now. And Salar, as an organization, represents all of those. So we are the voice from the local authorities and regions against the Swedish government. Or sometimes with, it depends. But we defend the right to make local decisions and not have laws all over the country, right? That's about it. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Uh, so this is the schedule for my little presentation here. I'm going to do background first. And this schedule will come back so you know where we are. Right? And if you have any questions, please ask them in English or in Finnish, and someone will help you translate. Okay? Background. Um, I think that figure kind of speaks for itself. This is the largest number of people displaced in the world since the Second World War. And of course, it's the conflict in Syria mostly. Uh, I think there are some 7 million Syrians being d displaced right now, most of them within the country, but I think some 3 million Syrians are actually leaving their country. So it's a big, big problem. And of course Sweden and I think also Finland just see a fraction of it, and we are still uh, sweating. So uh, there are other countries sweating more. In Sweden, in 2015, we had 163,000 asylum seekers. Finland had 32,000. So there were less, but considering that Finland in 2014 had 3.5 million thousand and Sweden had 81, the numbers are kind of equi equivalent. You also had a big increase, as did we. we. Our numbers were larger from the start, but still. And uh, s you see which countries provides the refugees and the countries that actually accept them or have them at the borders. So Turkey is the big leader here. And we don't hear a lot from Turkey. Or at least we don't. We don't hear a lot from uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish uh, local authorities and regions having problems. So they are obviously dealing with this problem in another way. Finland and Sweden are not even close to be on this list. Just as a little mindset. So Sweden are starting from a slightly higher level than Finland are. You can see the numbers from previous years, and you can see an increase in 2014, and then the big flux at the end of 2015. Uh, 
Um, we, we came up to 163,000. And, of course, being that we already had the number of asylum seekers and refugees coming to Sweden, we had a system for this. We had a healthcare system for this. We have a lot of things in place to actually uh, take care of these people that we desperately need. Sweden do, as I think Finland, have decreasing birth rates. So there are fewer children born in Sweden than it actually should be in order to have a healthy population. So we need new citizens and we want to take good care of them. So there was a system. How many of you meet uh, new Finnish people every day on a daily basis? Give me a hand. Okay, there's a bunch of you. Good. So you're part of that system here, right? But giving the big amount of people that came, of course, they were part of the society in Sweden, meeting these people that never had been involved before. There were people standing at the central station in Stockholm, at the platforms, <laughs> providing uh, orange juice and, and cinnamon buns to uh, families who have been traveling in trains for days. And those persons themselves were shocked and felt overwhelmed. And the people coming with the trains, of course, needed a lot of more help. And there were so many of them. So we had problems with everything. Where, where should they sleep? Where sh what should they eat? Where should they go? They were like, whew, the whole society went like, ah, we can't handle this. And now, as you know, we have like built our own little wall. Uh, and I won't talk about that, but you can see that the numbers are decreasing. But still, okay, so why should we do this? Because as an organization, SALA got a lot of signals from its members that this is, this is a problem for us for our local authorities and regions. We don't know what to do with this. There was, of course, humanitarian, humanitarian causes. Thank you. I look at you now when I have pronouncing difficulties, and you, you can mime to me. Um, people that came were stressed. They had had a tough time leaving their countries and coming to Sweden. Some of them were on those little rubber floats crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, they had poor mental health in many cases, not in all, but in many. And also, of course, economically for Sweden. If people come to our country and we take good care of them, they can provide. These people that come are resourceful, they are strong. Their health, their physical health is actually way better than the uh, average Swedes. They don't have any illnesses because then you can't do this, this hard travel to another country. Uh, put a strain on our public systems, but they are a big potential, a potential benefit to Sweden if we do this right. So there were a lot of uh, reasons for us to get involved. And also, there were no other public agency that felt that this is our responsibility. I think you might have the same problem in Finland. Everybody has their little, like, straw of responsibilities, but no one has, like, the whole thing. And we felt, okay, we, we, can, we can try to put the straws together and make some kind of pipe of it, and we can see where there are lack of knowledge, and we can try to help. That was our thought from the beginning. So the process, we applied to the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs to do a preparatory study. That went well, didn't it? Preparatory, I'm so proud of myself now. Uh, and we got a yes. And I just, I just showed you our reasons to do this. But the Ministry of Health was actually more bothered, I think, about the risk that had diseases spread all over the country. So they wanted everybody that came to Sweden to be checked and vaccined. Is that a word? Okay, they wanted everybody to have the vaccinations and be checked for TBC and other infectious diseases. That was their main goal. So we came, we came with our application and they said yes, with some uh, differences in, in what we wanted to achieve. But we said, okay, we can, we can straighten up these health checks, checkups for you, but then we want to add the big issue of mental health. Because that is our, the project that I'm working with, we are a mental health project. And then say, okay, do that. So we did. So we wanted to improve the immigration process in terms of healthcare. And healthcare here includes mental health. 
It's not just the body, it's also the soul and the mind. We wanted to increase the mental health, provide people with tools to feel better, to take care of their lives, and reduce suffering. And that's more like healthcare. So, so you can see there are like two parts. Make people themselves get a hold of their lives and start uh, living in their new country and also help the healthcare system take care of those who really can't. So the preparatory study is during a quite short period of time. Started in October and was supposed to be ready in March. So we had to run really fast. So we looked, okay, uh, what do we have to do? We had to we have to identify ill health, both physical and mental ill health. How do we do that? We do health exams. We started out with 43%. This is an offer. When you come to Sweden, there's like, oh, do you want a health exam? And you can say yes or you can say no. But problem is not everybody gets the offer, and when they do, they are already moving somewhere else, so they don't know where to go, and they might want to have the health exam, but they never come around to do it. So how do we increase the number of health exams? We need better interventions. Because we found out that people working with the asylum seekers didn't dare to ask about mental health. Because if someone said, okay, I feel crappy, I don't sleep, I have a lot of ex uh, ongest, anxiety, uh, anxiety, you know what I mean? Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, they didn't know what to do with it. So you ask the question, you get the answer, and you get scared. I don't want to talk about this. So they didn't. So we never identified people with bad mental health. So we needed better interventions. We needed the staff to feel, okay, I can ask about this. Because if you say yes, I know what to do. I know where to refer you, or I know what to do myself. We also knew that there were a lot of good things going in local authorities and regions. A lot of initiatives were already on the move. So we needed to share the best practice. We needed to, to make tools for planning and follow-up. So we actually knew what effect different things had. And that, that is for personnel and uh, management level, right? And the blue line there is for asylum seekers and newly arrived. How do we promote health? How do we build people's own strength in a new country? Information and education. You're still awake. Are you hungry? Slightly. Okay. I try to move fast. So we, we actually uh, put an online tool to identify good practice things. People could go there and say, okay, we here in Gjeble, we do this. And we have done it for so and so long time, and it seems to work all right, and maybe we have a little study or whatever. So we, we collected everything from the whole country. And then we picked the things that we thought were the best and tried to enhance them together with national experts. And then this poor county over here, it's Värmland, Karlstad. You know about that? No? Okay. It's a lot of good uh, cross-country skiing skiers coming from there. They were like, okay, we want to try this. Please try on us, because we have big problems. So we volunteer. So we did that. Uh, we tested them in Värmland before we decided to go national. We didn't go national with everything, actually, uh, because it turned out not everything was very good. So these were the products that we tested in Värmland. The digital uh, online sharing of best practice was already up and running. Uh, we made a tool for planning and follow-up, which was connected to an already existing tool for uh, the health exams. So right now, if you're like a boss somewhere, you can see, okay, we have this many uh, asylum seekers coming to our region right now. This and this many of them have already had their health checkup. And if we're moving along in this rate, we will be finished in 2024. So we need more staff or we need to work better. They can actually check their, uh, their figures. And we think a lot of in, in this uh, pyramid shape. The bottom here 
is what everybody should have, health promotion and prevention. Uh, the Swedish population also. Uh, it's very difficult actually as a Swede to uh, navigate in our health system. Where should I go when I have a bad hip? Do I go to my local practitioner or do I wait until I have to go to the emergency ward? Or It's, it's a mess. And it's not easy at all if you're new in Sweden and don't have the information to start with. And also we thought a basic education about migration and mental health. We know that there's like a normal level of mental stress if you have to run from your own country. It's not strange at all. It's the same kind of stress that we experience if we change our job, have a divorce, uh, move to a new flat and also um, get broke at the same time. You get stressed. You have the same stress or, I mean, you have a, like a normal level of stress if you are a refugee as well. So how do you deal with that? So the health screening is provided by professionals and we will look further into that. This is given directly to newcomers, refugees, asylum seekers, as is the health information. And if in the screening you turn out to have a problem, then you can be referred to a health group. And we made uh, guides and materials for these health groups, and I will talk more about those as well, because we realized that there were already, in, in the sh online sharing of best practice where we assembled things, there were like health schools for immigrants in Sweden, and they were quite long. And they were very, very thorough. And with the big influx we had, we realized, okay, this is a good thing. But if we, if we do it in this kind of slow rate, we will never reach everybody. So we needed like a light version of that, a quicker one, bigger groups, uh, shorter, more compact information, right? So that is the health group. And we also... Uh, are going to provide an online self-care advice, like um, you can log on and uh, you might have it in Finland as well. Um, sorry? <laughs> can you say it again? Mielenterveystalo. Okay, I don't know what that means, do you? Yes? Okay, everybody's happy. Perfect. Uh, so you have a problem and you get online help with it, basically. And this is for people with severe mental illness. And now we are like in psychiatric wards, more or less. Telephone and video support and basic education. What is PTSD? How do you recognize it? How can you uh, be sure that it, this patient is not uh, schizophrenic or psychotic, but suffering from PTSD? How can you ask someone if he or she has been exposed to torture? without being rude or starting a process that you can't handle. That kind of very concrete advice. Because we have experts in Sweden, but they, um, they have problems with reaching everybody, of course. So we put this online. So we're going to look just closer on the two things, health group and health screening. So this is health screening. The, the trial in Värmland showed us that we needed to uh, be more specific about the point with this. Why should you go to a health screening? What's in it for you? What's the thing? So we, we made uh, informations and invitations in different languages saying, okay, it's for free. It doesn't affect your asylum process at all if it turns out that you are HIV positive. It, no one will tell. Okay, it's a secret. Um, so there were a lot of basic facts in there, that this is good for you, it's good for you to know if you have TBC or not. Um, and we also made questionnaires in different languages. And of course it's smart to do this on a national level, instead of every 20 regions doing it by themselves. And me as a former journalist, I can say that this is not easy. We got... Uh, we were going to translate it to Somali, and we wanted to say that all the children would have a, a vaccination. And the translation told that every child would be... Um, now, what's the English word? 
impregnated. Something like that. It was not good. We were so happy that there were actually a Somali-speaking doctor that said, oh, don't say that. Because we can check the translations, right? We give them Swedish text and we get something back in Somali and we have no idea what it says. So we needed to check the translations. And I'm happy we did. <clears throat> okay, this is uh, for personnel to manage these support groups. This was also a problem because they were like, okay, so how am I going to deal with uh, 35 people speaking Arabic? What am I going to do with them? So we have been very, very concrete. We have like uh, screening questions in the beginning and also here a template to introduce this offer, but also we made session guides. Okay, the first session, say this, do this. Here is films in Arabic, here is information in Arabic, work with a talk. In Translate it, thank you. Uh, and do these sessions in this order. We wanted to give uh, the staff who was going to do this a very safe box to operate within. Uh, and I think we did. And also a diploma in the end. Um, and also for the asylum seekers themselves, we made films with Swedish personnel with their backgrounds in these countries. So uh, this woman I think is a nurse and she is speaking in Somali. I think. It's kind of different uh, or difficult or impossible actually uh, to know uh, because there's also text here in Somali. But we are lucky in Sweden. We have even an um, organization for Swedish Somali doctors. People born in Sweden, educated in Sweden, fluent in Swedish, but with a Somali background. So they, they know the, the Somali culture and they know the Swedish healthcare system by heart. So we have worked a lot with them. Uh, so these are the languages that we uh, aimed at at this point, and this is what we thought there was a need to know. Um, I don't know if I want to say this, but actually these are educated guesses from personnel that we met. We didn't have the time actually to go and ask people themselves, which we of course should have. Done. So that's something we would like to do if, if we keep on doing this. We would like to evaluate, is this the right thing? What do you miss? Because I'm sure we missed something. We know we missed out on women's health. Um, we need to talk more about teeth, oral health, water. There are the things that we totally missed. So we can do better, but still, this is, this is a start. And given the very short time, I hope we're excused. Okay, this is the tool for good examples. We have uh, got 89 of them so far and they are also uh, put in the system for everybody, for those with to mild and moderate and severe health. And there's a Verktygsbank, and I won't even try to translate that into English. Toolbox? More? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, sorry? Toolkit, great. It's on our website, uh, I show you the address later, and there's like an auto-translation thing there, so you can make this thing speak Finnish. I don't know how good it is though. I guess it will be a Google Translate thing, uh, but still, could be useful. Okay, so now we've been in Värmland. We did all this in a quite short time, and now we thought, okay, national, we have to go national with this. We can't just stay in Värmland. Uh, so we got new money. Uh, and we decided to try to do this on a national level. And we can't meet everybody working in the healthcare system or in schools or in uh, homes for uh, unaccompanied minors. We have to do this in another way. So we decided to do like a trainer, train the trainer thing. So we meet a few people in Stockholm and they go home. They get toolkits from us. So they go home and they do the same thing we did to them in Stockholm with their peers. And uh, they can decide for themselves, depending on how many uh, friends they get, if they go straight to the people that actually work with uh, asylum seekers or refugees, or if they have some middle things going. So think of it as a waterfall. 
We got 30 million crowns in June, and we were supposed to have this done by the end of the year. So we kept running, you might say. And that might be a reason why Helena, who was supposed to be here with me today, is not. <laughs> She's at home sick. She's quite overworked. But um, I think we did a quite good job. So we did this timeline. Question? No. No question. I'm talking a lot. Please ask if you have a question. Um, what do you need was our first question nationwide, because we know Värmland was like, oh, please come here, but we were not so sure about the others. What kind of needs did they have? So we asked them to uh, do a needs assessment and uh, we provided a digital form on the web in order for them to do their analysis, unless they didn't know. So what do we have? What don't we have? What needs do we have? How does our uh, existing infrastructure match those needs? They, they needed to do an, an analysis, and uh, quite a few of them did. Okay, so then we needed them to do a planning. They did to have one person at county level that took responsibility for this and have a plan for their local work when they have been in Stockholm, what to do when they come home. And then training the trainers and do a follow-up. It's, it's not very difficult, it's not very complicated when you think of it. But when you want 20 local authorities and regions, 20, local, 20 regions to do it, because this is on a regional level, it gets very complicated because they already uh, have their schedules full. They didn't, were, I mean, doing an analysis of their situation, oh God, it's a lot of work. Doing uh, a plan for the local work later, oh God. And the, the time was so short also, because everybody was already crammed up. So we actually have to squeeze in this, put it on people. But the good thing was that everybody uh, is very motivated. Everybody feels that this has to be done. We have to take care of the people, we have to take care of our own staff. If you can provide good tools for our staff to do this job, okay, then we try to do it. So 20 of 21 counties analyzed their needs. Uh, we got web forms from different services, 310 web forms. Three counties did independent analysis, and one county is still planning. Um, and you can see now, this is Stockholm area. They have done an independent study, of course. They have a lot of resources. Uh, this is Malmö, Gothenburg, planning to. Um, Sweden is, as I think Finland, quite uh, uneven when it comes to uh, where people live. So a lot of people live in the big cities, and that is, that is making their situation quite special. So they often have like their own solutions. So this is the analysis of those forms. And this is what we need, the, the, the rate of help needed, you could say. Materials and methods to give health information, 75% wanted that. Educate personnel, 78%. So there's a lot of, there's a big, um, big scale of needs, you can't say that, but there are uh, quite a few things that needs to be done. You can put it that way. And this is what we did on the different level. So this one especially, what the entire organization should know is like one course, one block that we do. And this is suitable for teachers, uh, for personnel in preschool, uh, everybody. Actually, not only, it says organization here, but I think it should say what every Swedish person should know. Um, it's very basic, but still good. And then it's all about health information and blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read this, actually. Um, 
But I hope that you can see that, that uh, the complication level increases the further up you go until you reach severe mental illness. And there we have like indications that like PTSD probably will increase the coming years because at first when you arrive you're very busy getting a job, getting an apartment, maybe reunite with your family, learning the language, you're very focused on your life in Sweden and as time goes by when you start to relax you might get PTSD problems in five years time. Uh, so we will definitely have to work with this further. Are you happy with this? Can I change? Everybody is ready? I think you will get the slides later also. Yeah, okay, great. And I've already spoken about these parts, professionals and asylum seekers. And the trainers then. Uh, okay, they got tools, uh, they got theory. And when they come to us in Stockholm, we do this. We also talk about them. Okay, when you come home, what do you do? When do you give this material to your peers? Do you have like work meetings when you can show a film or do a small part of this program with them? And also uh, manuals and presentations that they can use when they train further. So we really wanted to do this box that they can just bring home, open and deliver again. Okay, so how did we do? We have given different courses of 23 times and uh, have had a thousand participants. And as you do, we have filmed uh, these days. So if you weren't able to come to Stockholm for some reason, you can always look at the film in afterhand. 55% of them are uh, committed to train others. Uh, I would like that number to be 100, um, but that's hard. Again, time was a factor. We said, okay, come to Stockholm, learn about this. And they were like, oh, okay, but I, yeah. So there were a lot of people trying to, I, I want to come, but I can't. And can I come later? Or I want to go. And someone went and like, what? What am I doing here? So sometimes we've got people taking a course that really wasn't for them. Um, it's easier if you have a lot of time to explain and send out material beforehand and blah, blah, blah. But we didn't. So. 55% should be good. So in total, this spring we will have, we keep on doing actually courses now in January, February and March. Uh, and I was just talking to Helena this morning about that figure. We will have reached 3,750 3, and I said, okay, how many are there <laughs> that we should have reached? And we were like, ah, it's difficult to know. Because there are, of course, people everywhere in the public sector in Sweden meeting immigrants and asylum seekers, uh, bus drivers, uh, people at uh, supermarkets. Um, there are so many. And if you, if you go back to PTSD, you can have a PTSD, uh, what can I say, fit? PTSD, anxiety attack anywhere, at the library or wherever. Um, so that, that figure doesn't really um, carry a lot of information for you, but still, it's a, it's a number. And it's also maybe um, in some way you can think that, okay, it's possible actually within six months to do this if you get the money and run really fast. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but I can feel sometimes that everything is like, oh, it won't be possible, we can do this. And uh, I get a little depressed, but okay, we can, if we really try, it's possible. Um, the tool for monitoring and planning the healthcare system that I told, about, told you about earlier, uh, a lot of the counties has connected to that. Um, and some have not. And we were speaking about children and uh, adolescents, and I wrote this in Swedish just for me to remember. <laughs> uh, because this is one of, I think, the 
best things that we have in Sweden right now concerning unaccompanied uh, young people. What's the word? Yeah. Minors, thank you. It's called Find the Right Way, Hitta Rätt. It's uh, made for the personnel in uh, the homes where they get to stay, Hobby Beham in Swedish, I don't know. We have like uh, home-like environments where these kids often stay. And they don't have the information that Swedish kids do about libraries. Can I have a card to go and buy books, really, or lend books? Uh, healthcare system, how do I do when I want to leave home? How do I make good food? There are a lot of stuff that, if you're born in a country, you know all this, because you have dealt with it your whole life, and these kids don't. So, uh, Find Your Own Way is a structured uh, way of working through different parts of society and giving, providing the knowledge, practice. Um, it's very good and there is the website. Feel free to contact them and say that you want to translate the whole thing to Finnish. I think they will be happy, actually. Um, so we will report to uh, our ministry in the end of this month. But what we can see right now is that we will have increasing problems with undocumented immigrants because we uh, have, of course, now only temporary residence permits, which makes uh, people unhappy. They can't reunite with their families. Uh, they really don't commit to learn Swedish or getting to know the country because they know that they will be probably kicked out. And that's a huge challenge when it comes to mental health. It's a huge challenge for teenagers. Uh, how do you make them reasonably uh, happy and integrated while they're here? How do you motivate them? We have right now an increase in suicides, of course. The friends get uh, kicked out of the country, they can't reunite, they feel that they can't go back. So this is a challenge for us. Uh, we know that the, we are actually creating mental ill health with this system. We are creating mental ill health with uh, long periods of waiting where people are staying at uh, asylum facilities, not getting to do anything really. It's very hard to remain happy in that environment. Uh, and when we speak to uh, the personnel taking our classes, they frequently tell us that especially the youngsters, they are losing hope in society. <laughs> they are losing hope in, in Sweden helping them. Uh, and we have to deal with that somehow. That was a very sad end, but <laughs> still. Um, I hope uh, that what we have done, especially for uh, the people working, for nurses, teachers, practitioners in different fields has, has given them a possibility. If they can't come to our classes, all the films or the lectures are online, so they can go there and look for seven minutes on someone talking about PTSD or how do I, as a social worker, uh, give a good... Um, how do I do a good meeting with someone who needs everything? So we, we, we hope that, and we hope that in the end it actually has made a difference for the people coming to Sweden. And we uh, hopefully get more money in order to investigate and uh, get the proof of my hopes in the end. Okay, questions? You haven't asked anything so far.
Thank you, Lotta, very much. I think the, uh, from the I think mental health point of view that the end was sad, but I think at least we can say openly what is sad. So thank you for bringing it that this in the end that we are actually creating also ill. We know that we are. Yes, yes. yes. So I think at least we have to address this and, and realize and talk and then we mm -hmm. perhaps find a solution. But we, we don't get the solutions if we don't Let's talk about it. Yeah, no, true. But it's also hard as a, as a practitioner. When you work with these people and you feel like, okay, this person has cancer and I'm providing a band-aid. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can see you know the feeling. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and you know something that actually is made make a great change and you can't really affect that. You're trapped in the system. And that is something you have to live with every day. And it's very frustrating. I know that. Oh, my first question. I'm excited. Uh, I would like to just ask that uh, when you made the training materials, did you tailor them specifically differently for, for example, health personnel or education personnel? Or were they, were they the same for all municipal personnel? Yes, more or less the same. Um, because um, the material were... Uh, it's... Actually, the, the, the end receiver is the asylum seekers themselves. So uh, you should actually do the same, whether you're a teacher or a health practitioner. You should give the same information about Swedish society, Swedish healthcare, blah, blah, blah. So they are pretty much the same. But then the lectures for a specialist level, they could be different. Uh, like I said earlier, social workers, uh, psychologists, uh, psychiatric, uh, professionals, so there, there are a little bit of differences. Uh, but school is actually one of the things that we think that we need to do more. Because especially for the kids, um, their problems are often visible in school. And we know that teachers and healthcare uh, personnel in schools uh, have a need for more information. Yeah. Um, uh, do you know, did this amazingly massive train, uh, training program produce already some, uh, some uh, uh, actual shifts in the health of refugees? Or? It's a brilliant question. Yeah. Uh, we don't know. We don't know. Um, we are still, if, if you remember the pyramid with people, there was like one in the top and there were blah, blah, blah. We are still somewhere in the middle. Uh, some regions ha are starting to actually give these courses to immigrants, uh, but most of them are still planning to do it. So they will probably give the courses to immigrants during this year and then maybe we can do some kind of uh, follow-up. All, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask about the questionnaire you give to, to people, to, mm -hmm. to refugees, mm -hmm. because there's a project in Finland now, something with this. Do you, um, I ask precisely, do you ask questions like, like, have you been in prison? Have you been tortured? Do you have violence in family? Have you been committed in crime? Uh, I mean, have you done? Uh, have you been sued? for crime? Mm -hmm. Have you been circumcised? Mm -hmm. Do you ask this? Good question. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I know that we have had discussions because every region uh, have their own kind of questionnaire and we try to merge them until, until one like, okay, if you don't have it you can do like this, like a national uh, suggestion. But I wasn't involved in that work. So uh, may I bring your question home and check it instead of guessing? Yeah. I think we do, but I'm not quite sure. And if uh, by any chance you speak Arabic or Somali or whatever, the films about uh, health in Sweden on those languages are online, so you can look at them. And if you find any faults, please tell me, <laughs> because I don't know those languages. Uh, but all the material is on our website, you can go there and do the auto uh, translation into Finnish and have some fun. 
Shall I show the website, maybe? Yes, please. I do that. <laughs> and I will stay for lunch, and you can have my card if you want to ask something later. No. Okay, so uh, Solar has one web page and we have another because we do so many things that we don't really fit under Solar's uh, web page. So this is ours and there's a lot of stuff here uh, about everything actually. And okay, there it is. There is Asylum Seekers and Newly Arrivals. And these are the educations we made. And this is what the whole organization should know. And should we try this? Other languages. Is this? Yeah. Yes. It's OK. Yeah. Great. Suomi. And this? OK, good. <laughs> cool, isn't it? Thank you. It's all my work. It's something technical, I don't really know how it works. And it's probably not very good, but it's better than Swedish for you guys. Uh, so feel free to surf around and have a look. Do you have a question? No comment? Oh. I'm so nicely surprised seeing the translation and the long list of different languages um, because I am a nurse and my basic language is English, like I speak Farsi in English and a little bit of Finnish and whenever I work in a reception center and whenever I go to Miel and Tervu's page and I want to get some information to transfer to the refugees and then when I press mute kill it and I go to other languages and I choose English, for example, then instead of the long list that I see on the Finnish page, just two or three <laughs> options open. And then when I press for more languages, then the, more, the less okay. options I'll get. Oh, okay. And then I was really surprised that mm. here, when you press another language, the exact information just yeah. comes up. And that's really what you expect. And this is a WordPress site. And I think that's like a plugin for WordPress. Mm. So, and I think that can be used by any, any other nurses, yeah. like in any other countries. Yeah, then. sure. Thank you. I'm happy that you are happy. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, thank you Good. very much, Charlotte. And we have present for you <laughs> and Helen, and this is all you need <laughs> to know about Finland. Okay, but great. Maybe there has to be updated. <laughs> Uh, version and uh, incre uh, put something about the refugees because oh, yeah. I think it's very mon monocultural okay. book. But happens after five years. This maybe thank you very one. much. <laughs> thank you.